One of the first ministries of culture in the Western Hemisphere was organized in Nicaragua following the overthrow of the Somoza dictatorship. The ministry was led by a poet and priest. Today on Roundtable Perspective, Dr. Kenneth Kincaid joins me in examining the role of popular culture, protest poetry, and political power in the Nicaraguan Revolution and other social movements across the continent. Welcome to the Roundtable Perspective. I am your host, Lee Arts. I'm joined today by my guest, Dr. Kenneth Kincaid, to discuss popular culture and political change, um, in particular, the Nicaraguan Revolution and protest poetry. Welcome, Dr. Kincaid. Well, thank you. Thank you for inviting me. Um, I see that you had your PhD in Latin American history at the University of Kansas, and you did your dissertation and your master's thesis on the 20th century Nicaraguan protest poetry the struggle for cultural hegemony. So right. we want to talk a bit about that period of Nicaragua, the 1979 revolution and beyond. And I think we also should put that in the context of today where Nicaragua is in the crosshairs of um, US concern. There's sure. been sanctions, there's been articles in the New York Times that kind of demonizes Nicaragua as a threat mm -hmm. to peace in the in the region. So I just am struck by your understanding of popular culture, Ernesto Cardinal, the songwriters, sure. the singers, a nation of poets is a whole different feel for what Nicaragua is like. So mm -hmm. I just maybe give us some background of the role of poetry and uh, music in, in sure. Nicaragua. Sure. Well, um, I would like to clarify, if you don't mind, uh, and, and I tried to follow the same theme of hegemony, but for my dissertation, I actually looked at indigenous uprisings in, um, in Ecuador, in fact, and really what the land and the landscape and bodies of water meant to native peoples. And I ended up breaking down into the same pattern of, of resistance of cultural resistance and really what certain things mean to people mm -hmm. enough to get them to rebel. And, and that's what happens in Nicaragua with, with poetry and the use of the pen instead of a sword to try to bring down a dictatorship, a family dictatorship. And so when you look at Nicaragua, it's oftentimes been um, called a land of poets and in fact that everybody's mm -hmm. a poet. And I've been to Nicaragua, and actually I stayed with a poet for about a week, and he's not a really well-known poet, uh, but uh, he had written some beautiful verse, and he let me stay with him for, like I said, for uh, three or four days. Uh, we did some, we just really kind of hung out and, and met some other people. Uh, he showed me his workshop, and uh, he, uh, yeah, it was a beautiful experience. Uh, but in doing research, uh, I wanted to go ahead and try to understand the Nicaraguan Revolution not through the politics of the U.S. and Nicaragua or um, what they identified as socialism and capitalism, but I really wanted to look at it through the lens of, of poetry. Mm -hmm. and, and, and interestingly, in my latter chapters of the thesis, I found that there was a counter, a, a contra, you know, as the Contras were opposed to the uh, Sandinistas, there was a counter movement of poetry against the Sandinista poetry. Yes. And, and so uh, it does, in my opinion, it does illustrate just how powerful the, the verse and the pen are. Let's break that down a little bit for, the, for our viewers. Sure. Because um, one is Ruben Dario. Sure. Um, you said it's a nation of poets. I just, I just wonder, what's the historical um, basis for that? Because you don't think of El Salvador, you don't think of Honduras or other countries as a nation mm -hmm. of poets. And I know immediately after they removed Somoza, there was a Ministry of Culture and there was little sure. poetry workshops on every corner. Why is yeah. that part of the culture in Nicaragua, which seems to be more expressive poetically right. than in other countries? Is there some material basis for that or everybody wanted to be Ruben Dario I don't I never understood why that was why such that a... was yeah you know that's something when I did my district or when I did my thesis uh, I, I, I dabbled with and I and I got a lot of different responses some said that uh, 
it, it, it's the landscape, the beauty mm. of the lakes and the mountains, and you know that actually feeds into verse. And uh, all, others said it's the appreciation of the history of poetry again with Dario, and others as well. Uh, and then also Dario, though he's never really considered political, did no, write right. did write an anti-imperial poem uh, uh, directed toward Roosevelt. And it was uh, an, an directed towards American intervention in Nicaragua. And I think that it kind of latched on to a lot of people that poetry can be beautiful, that poetry can speak to the natural world, but poetry can also incite people to a political perspective. And I think Dario does this. And, um, but he was also the muse of Nicaragua, and he was celebrated in France, when, when and he was when celebrated. When does he live? What, what years? Well, there is late 19th century, so, early 20th century. Right. But um, I think that in a lot of ways, it's like when you have somebody who is recognized, especially from a developing country like Nicaragua, where most people only saw Nicaragua as a place for, for imperialists or for companies to go in yeah. to exploit the land, to exploit the people. Uh, but to have somebody who actually gains international prominence, like Dario, that people felt proud. I mean, the question is, would poetry have been as strong had Dario never lived? Mm -hmm. I doubt that. I think that people really felt that this was a way to break from being a nobody to being someone. And when you look at the history of, the, uh, of poetry, uh, we, we could look at, it, it really is a trajectory of U.S. intervention and also political trends in the 20th century. From the 1930s, poetry that was somewhat bent between fascism and, uh, and, and, and socialism to the 50s where we really see poetry that's uh, pushing for a reemplacement of the Somoza dictatorship. Yeah. Well, I, I ask because I wonder if uh, poetry as a form of communication because becomes one of the few public and private spaces mm -hmm. in, a, in a nation like Nicaragua that was occupied by the Marines for 30 years and then had a dictatorship for sure. 30 or 40 years and mm -hmm. you don't have access to the radio, you don't have access to school. Literacy is fairly limited, but the idea that you can have poetry and not necessarily rhyming poetry, because no. Ernesto Cardinal would talk about it. Right. I think an exteriorismo, he would call it, that was mm -hmm. poetry was outside that. So I wonder if it, Almost inherently, it becomes political because the very fact that you turn to poetry is a is well, a recognition that there's no space for me to right. talk with you, share with you, because there's a dictator, or there's right. the Marines, or there's well, it, some other oppressive force there. It, it does speak to the the question of hegemony, and it does speak to the question that of a high culture, of a culture of poetry and music and art that really very few in a country like Nicaragua has access to. However. You know, almost like basketball is, where you only need a hoop and a ball right. and you can play. With poetry, you just need a voice. Right. You don't even necessarily need to write it down because exactly. it's an oral tradition. So. Exactly. So it, 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 by its nature, it can subvert what we consider art mm -hmm. or the paradigms of high art. And so that's what makes it particularly powerful, that it can be recited and it can galvanize. It can move people. It can move people to rebel. And so that's what I saw in, in, in Nicaragua. But one of the other things is the people were really political. And in fact, yeah. there were efforts to, um, I believe it was the first Somoza, uh, an intent to assassinate him by a poet. Mm. And, yeah. and, and so uh, it, it, it's extraordinary. Yeah, so when you're, when you're talking about the poetry is not necessarily explicitly political, it's almost political despite itself exactly. because I'm writing poetry about whatever, love, freedom, nature, mm -hmm. in a society that uh, kind of restricts all of that. I know sure. I was in Nicaragua f a few times. I remember I met a young woman who was a biologist, but mm -hmm. she had also joined the Sandinista uh -huh. National Liberation Front. And she said, to be a biologist in Nicaragua is to be a revolutionary. Yeah. Because the only way I could protect plants, animals, et cetera, was to be op opposed to the Somoza dictatorship. Right, so. which, which ultimately wanted to exploit all resources. Yes and um, benefit their foreign um, benefactors, yeah. right? Uh, it, it's interesting, and I, um, I do actually have some brown books, and they're called Poesia Libre, and they were actually created by the Talleres de Poesia in, in Nicaragua. I picked them up when I was in Nicaragua, and uh, they look like 
trash bags. Or, I mean, <laughs> or not trash bags, I take that back. They looked like um, paper bags. Yeah, yeah, grocery paper, paper bags. And, and yeah. that's what they looked like. And, and, they, were, and there's, they were printed on, uh, but they said that there are others that are just all handwritten. And so this was representative of, on one hand, having a peasant, a campesino, writing or learning to write poetry. And across from that, on the other page, you would find um, Dario, or you would find Ernesto yeah. Cardenal. Or uh, and so that or Daisy Somora, yeah. and, and so that became a way of saying, you know, it's there's not an elite culture. We are all together, yeah. regardless of how well we're known, you know, but we are all together. And so, uh, yeah, it's um, it, it, they're very they're very beautiful. Those, those, those I, I think it would be helpful, and I want to talk more about protest poetry, particularly in the time of the revolution against the dictator. But it may be helpful to have a a very brief. Uh, re, 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 <laughs> Uh, representation of the Sandinista National Liberation Front. I mean, Sandino was a opposed U.S. intervention in the 20s. He was assassinated by the, the first Somoza. The Sandinistas formed a group in the 60s, I believe, and then we have, now it's called the Sandinista Revolution, and Ortega is the current president and criticized for being a mm -hmm. Sandinista. So maybe you, you can put the when we, we've talked a couple times now about Sandinista, so maybe you can give us a brief history of what that means to be a Sandinista without necessarily the politics of today, sure. but if that's possible in a short... Well, <laughs> it, it is a bit of a challenge, yes. though, isn't it? Because, you know, to call yourself a Sandinista today doesn't mean the same thing... As the 60s. Uh, of, ...of the 60s or, or the 70s. Yep. I think a lot of us came to a, a desire to know more and to learn more about Nicaragua through what we read, a, a real um, a romantic view of, of, of revolution. Uh, we read um, Daisy Samora, we read uh, Gioconda Belli. Mm -hmm. uh, we, we read these wonderful writers who talked about Nicaragua in terms that, that inspired us. And also the Sandinistas and the youth of the Sandinistas and the idealism. So sometimes the question I think is, how do people view them today? And also, how are they depicted today? Now, it's interesting you said what you said about uh, the Sandinistas. They are demonized, they're vilified today, and they were vilified in the 70s as well. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and, and so, um, and in the end, we, we find out that really what they were asking for, sure, it was revolutionary, but it wasn't, it wasn't to be guided by Moscow. No. It wasn't to be told that this is your revolution. It was not a, it wasn't an effort to try to impose uh, socialism on Nicaragua. Nicaraguans very much want, or Sandinistas very much wanted to have a revolution on their own terms. Yeah. Um, and they were willing to play with the market. You know, they were willing to have some market um, in the economy as well as state-run enterprises. Yeah. And so uh, I, I think that, that, there, that there is no essential Sandinismo. Yes. You, you yes. know what I mean? Yeah. And, and so today, the question is, who are calling themselves Sandinistas? And is there a view that some people are no longer you know, upholding what it means to be a Sandinista? And, and, and frankly, I would say that if you really want to go to what Sandinismo would mean, it would certainly be a, uh, a resistance to a, a, a much greater power, yes. to the point of being an underdog, like Sandino was. Um, but they resisted and they fought, and in the end, they were able to get the American uh, Marines, or the U.S. Marines, out of Nicaragua. And okay. then they were also able to get the dictator. Exactly the, the right. The dictator's son and the dictator's other son, sure. 40 years a dictator. After, and right, after, from, from 36 to 79. Right. And, 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 and it took a long time, but, so, you know, it, what is the essence of Sandinismo? It's certainly resistance to a much larger right. Uh, power. And I th and I think I think it's also important to note in the 80s, uh, San San Sandin Sandinismo meant certain things like sure. literacy. They won Absolutely. an award from the United Nations for eradicating literacy with all mm -hmm. the students going to the countryside. Um, I studied uh, popular radio there. They had an yeah. entire Cora depth, the People's uh, Corporation of Public uh, Popular mm -hmm. Broadcasting, where there were 26 stations and everybody could have access to the radio station. Right. And they had land reform, and they recognized the farm workers union. And, and so there's this and whole this feel it of meant. it's like there's this. We've not only gotten rid of Somoza and the dictatorship, mm -hmm. but there's almost this. 
feeling of, uh, of freedom, right? Yeah, and exactly. so they all become poets, and they and they all and they all become. I mean, because and in the singing, end, and then sure, in yes. the end, it's not it's not enough to get rid of of the samosas. You also have to start creating a new society, yeah. and this is why it was so frustrating to see that that. For that other powers, that the U.S. in particular, was not allowed to see this revolution grow. Right. Um, and uh, because of U.S. involvement, because of the Contras, uh, we, we see really a complete undermining of, uh, uh, of all the efforts that the Sandinistas right. made. And, and so whenever anyone said, well, you know, this was a failure and this was a failure, you know, my response is also, come on, you know, <laughs> did, did they really even have a chance yeah. to see how successful they could be? Yeah, the U.S. was mining the harbor at Corinto. They were financing the country. Within two years. Set we, we, up assassinations exactly. of teachers and, uh, and that. Yeah. The, the, the interesting thing for me, though, is the appeal that not just poetry, but poetry and music and the general what, popular culture, cuisine mm -hmm. even. Yeah. Um, Ernesto Cardinal and Solitanami, and they're doing the little paintings. And yeah. I know the American Baptists, for one, sure. were enamored with the Sandinista Revolution because right. they would have sister cities and there would be exchanges, mm -hmm. and they actually got to know the people, which was not just knowing the poetry, but to knowing the people and their aspirations. Yeah. Under the, the figurehead of uh, Sandino was mm -hmm. more, what you're saying, a humanitarian right. impulse, and a humanitarian impulse. So. I absolutely agree with that. And when you look at people like uh, Cardinal, he, he meant so much. He meant so much for the revolution. He was the minister of culture. No other country had a ministry of culture. Yes. Nicaragua had a ministry of culture, yes. and he was the minister of culture. And he was and a priest. And he was a priest. And he was a priest. Right. And, and he had to actually be threatened. He was actually threatened by Pope John Paul II uh, with um, um, Ex excommunication, excommunication yeah. unless he left the government. And he couldn't do it. He couldn't do it. Yeah. It was an extraordinary image of a cardinal on a knee getting ready to uh, kiss the Pope's ring and the Pope just chastising him <laughs> right there. Um, it was, well, you know, one of the things that when we were in Nicaragua, we got to meet were a lot of the people from the base communities, mm -hmm. which uh, for our viewers, uh, base communities are communities that have embraced liberation theology. And liberation theology is a view, it really comes from Catholicism, but a view that uh, Jesus was, um, was uh, more interested in Preferential helping. Preferential option for the poor. Right, right, <laughs> yes. right, for the poor. Yes. And, and so you would look at the New Testament and you would say, look at, you know, look at who Jesus was with. And so going back to uh, um, Gustavo Gutierrez, I think that was his name, mm -hmm. a Peruvian um, who actually declared what liberation theology was in the early 60s, it, it spread like a wildfire mm -hmm. because it explained that, okay, that the church can actually do something progressive and helpful for the poor. And so we see, for example, in Colombia, in El Salvador, in many other places in Latin America, in, 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 um, in, in Mexico as well, uh, where priests would uh, not only side with the poor, not only denounce the military and denounce um, capitalism, but in some cases they took up arms. Mm -hmm. And Cardinal doesn't essentially do that unless you want to consider a pen a weapon. Yeah. And in that case, he does. So, um, yeah, uh, it's it, it still, you know, even after all these years, because it's been a while since I, I wrote that thesis, it, it still kind of inflames the, the passions of... of, of well, I, I, it's, it's one of the reasons I get inspired in the midst of uh, what some people see as a dark time politically, globally, that the... Uh, examples of the Nicaraguan Revolution, or I would argue the Venezuelan Revolution, mm -hmm. Chavez or Bolivia today, is this human spirit that we want right. to be human, that we want to we want to write poetry, we want to dance in the streets, we want to have music, we want to learn to, right, sure. to sing. Um, it's, it's inspirational, and this is a country of three million people, mm -hmm. right, with four or five different languages, and they're still they get rid of Somoza, what's the first thing they do? It's not like they charge the factories or look for the U.S. Embassy or something. They, they go to poetry circles. Mm -hmm. right. and, and we're going to write, we're free, let's write poetry. So it, it, it's, I, a, it's, it's extraordinary what happened. And one of the things that, you know, if, if Latin America can export something, they, 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 or if they, one of the things they do export is idealism. Mm -hmm. And uh, whether it's in... You know, when, I, when, when the uh, wars in Central America were really uh, going on, I was, at the, I was at Kansas State University, 
And I got involved with a group that was a, I think it was a, a ecumenical Christian ministries type group. But every week they had rice and beans, and every <laughs> week we had guest speakers. <laughs> and and the, it was like, you know, we, we were able to keep up with uh, Latin America through them. I um, we, we don't have a lot of time left, but we, we started out, you'd, you noted how you started with your master's thesis and then goes to your PhD and look at indigenous mm -hmm. popular culture. And I, I think the example of Nicaragua, and I would argue the example of community radio in Venezuela and indigenous struggles in Bolivia, speak to what you're identifying as this um, connection between popular culture, uh, popular participation, right. political consciousness, and the attempt to construct a new society. So mm -hmm. I, I just wondered if you would if, if that summation fits with the other uh, things that you've looked at? I, I think so. Um, you know, when I did my master's thesis, I, I got into Gramsci, and uh, uh, I don't know if our viewers know much about Gramsci, uh, but Gramsci uh, was an Italian Marxist, and he wrote about culture, and he talked about cultural hegemony, but he also talked about organic intellectuals, and they were to be differentiated from the high-class intellectuals. Yep. And he or argued that organic intellectuals can be, they, they can be an indigenous leader from a society, it could be a, 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 a poetry writer, uh, but these are, peoples that are, these are people that are art, able to articulate uh, what is important, the, the principles of a people or, or the things that they stand yep. for. And so in, in Ecuador, Part of my argument was, was that you know, when companies or when cities came in to try to expropriate lands, especially lands that were close to lakes, they weren't doing, it wasn't just an attack on the physical property, it was also an attack on sometimes what we call say, a sacred space. Mm -hmm. And so people would, would resist that. They would. Um, That's they, their way of life. Exactly. I mean, yes. Yeah. Okay. And, and so there'd be leaders that would come out there and remind people. It, wouldn't, it wasn't poetry, but it was, it was still art. And they would point out that you know the mountain you know is considered a, a in Ecuador it would be considered a male uh, waka a male yeah. uh, and then the lake is female and this is a divinely or, or a sacred space having the two of them together it was a sacred visual alignment and so the people that lived along the lake shore benefited from that they they were in this sacred space and so when companies came in and they said we want those lakes or um, or we want that space there for a hotel yeah. then they would resist. And so I tried to understand that in terms of culture again, in terms of cultural and, and um, hegemony, which in this case would be uh, what's considered progress and the expropriation of physical landscapes for progress, for profit, and then also the organic intellectuals that argued that no, since time immemorial we've lived here and we've been part of the sacred space. It seems like when we talk about hegemony, that's a battle for what kind of world we want and what we're going to identify with what we're going to consent to. Right. So in the case of Nicaragua, I would argue part of the reasons the Sandinistas had hegemony and the consent and support of the general population is because they merged liberation theology, Christian-based communities, along mm -hmm. with some Marxist-inflected things like organizing sure. unions, along with the history of the popular culture going all the way back to their own Sandino and Dario and the rest. And I would assume yeah. I don't know as much about Ecuador, but I would assume the similar process was at work. It's not so much that the indigenous are against progress. It's that their cultural identity and what they consent to is mm -hmm. a world that's defined and understood this way, that right. nature is part of us, we are part of it. The rituals, the yeah. experience, the daily life, all depends upon how we mm -hmm. view the world. Well, I, I think you're right. And one of the things I would argue also is that when we look at hegemony, and victims of hegemony, hegemony, they tend to be passive. But those people that take agency, those people that act, they tend to be our organic intellectuals. Yep. And if we look at that case again of Ecuador, we would argue that, the, um, that to, us, to just comply with the demands of, of the cities and the demands of the companies would be passive and yep. it would be giving in. It would allow this, it would be allowing someone else to define what the norm is. But it sounds like popular culture in America today. Exactly, right? <laughs> as, as opposed to what you might argue would be hip-hop or even certain elements in country music that mm -hmm. suggests a certain different way of being that mm -hmm. challenges the, you know, the larger consumer culture that says, no, we can be human in this way, mm -hmm. we can share in this way, right. we can learn from each other in this way. And, and, and the, in, in the end, the most important thing is that 
pe that, that in this case Native peoples have a voice in what they consider progress, yep. a voice in what is development. Uh, one of the cases that I looked at, which ended up in a massacre of Native peoples in 1959, uh, the, the, the city forefathers and the hotel, um, the potential hotel owners, they had an opportunity to put the hotel on another side of the lake that would have not caused any problems mm -hmm. at all. But they chose to put it right there in the indigenous community that consider that lake and mountain so sacred. And you end up with a protest. You end up with a but protest. But it's inspiring. So sometimes the protest is said poetically, like in the case of Nicaragua. Sometimes mm -hmm. it's more explicitly political. Mm -hmm. um, we're exactly out of time. Right. <laughs> it Unfortunately, went fast. it uh, went fast. Uh, maybe we can have you back and we can talk about some other instances oh, I would of love popular to. culture. And, uh, and, and, and when you invite me back, if it's possible, I will actually bring my Poesia Libres and we can show oh, the excellent, audience. Oh, excellent. Yeah. Okay. That's all the time we have on our program. Thank you, Dr. Kenneth Kincaid, for today on Roundtable Perspective. I'm Lee Arts. See you next time.